Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out. And in the video today, we're answering a viewer question. Yachna N asks, why do movie studios release near identical movies at the same time? Just before we get started, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by Cheddar. If you're looking for another great YouTube channel with similar content to this one, please check out Cheddar through the link in the description below. Well, twin films is the term used to describe a peculiar Hollywood phenomenon that just about every year sees different major studios releasing movies with almost identical plots and themes to their competitors' current offerings. Popular examples of this include Deep Impact and Armageddon, two films released within weeks of one another that centered around saving the world from a giant meteor. Other popular examples include A Bug's Life and Ants, animated films about ants rebelling against their hive, then there's Dante's Inferno and Volcano, both of which are disaster films about volcanic eruptions. To give you an idea of just how common this is in Hollywood, all of these films mentioned were released between 1997 and 1998. Oh, and then how about Chasing Liberty and First Daughter, two romantic comedies released in 2004 centered around the idea of the romantic escapades of the president's rebellious teenage daughter. Sticking with the White House here, we have the March 22, 2013 release of Olympus Has Fallen, followed by the shockingly similar June 8, 2013 film White House Down, which, to be fair, are both mostly just diehards, but in the White House. While it's tempting to think that this is something of a modern phenomenon deriving from the popular meme that Hollywood has simply run out of ideas, in truth, twin films are as old as the film industry itself. So let's answer the question, how do these come about? Well, it turns out there are a variety of things that may result in twin films, with everything from corporate espionage to pure coincidence coming into play. For example, one of the most famous films of all time, Gone with the Wind, is also one of the most noteworthy twin films in history. In this case, famed actress Betty Davis failed to secure the role of Scarlett O'Hara in MGM's Gone with the Wind. Looking to make her own Civil War film, Warner Brothers snapped up the rights to a Broadway play called Jezebel, which, like Gone with the Wind, was all about a fiercely independent Southern woman during the Civil War. They then cast Davis in the title role and slapped together a film as quickly as possible in order to get it out before Gone with the Wind. While they were totally successful in this endeavor with the film being a hit and Davis even winning an Oscar for her role in the movie. However, while Jezebel was well received, it was soon eclipsed by its twin film, Gone with the Wind, which would set a record for the most Academy Awards and nominations, sell around 25 million tickets from 1939 to 1940, and then be reissued in 1941 and 1942, bringing the total up to just shy of an astounding 60 million tickets sold. This made it the highest grossing film ever made up to that point. In fact, it still is generally considered as such after you adjust for inflation. Now, to be fair, some modern films like Avatar have come close to those numbers when adjusting for inflation. Also, Gone with Wind has been re-released many times over the years, which has padded the numbers. If you do not consider the re-releases, indeed, Gone with the Wind does no longer hold the top spot. Indeed, it is entirely possible that a few decades from now, many of these modern films are going to surpass it. Although it's interesting to note that some of the movies near the top aren't really going to have much staying power. Indeed, number six is currently Fast and the Furious number seven, and we doubt that's going to benefit from a flurry of re-releases over the coming decades. In any event, other twin films alleged to have surfaced as a result of intentional corporate shenanigans include the aforementioned Deep Impact and Armageddon. This is largely because the latter film mysteriously went into production just weeks after Deep Impact was announced. A lawsuit indeed was threatened as a result, but ultimately nothing ever came of it. Likewise, it's been long rumored that the idea for the DreamWorks film Ants was stolen from Disney by Jeffrey Katzenberg, the then CEO of the studio. Prior to working for DreamWorks, Katzenberg had worked for Disney, and it's alleged that when he jumped ship, he took an idea Disney had been working on about an animated film about a nonconformist ant, and then made this movie his own. Again, nothing ever came of these allegations, and it's still not clear which studio had the idea first. Another reason for twin films coming to be is just the timing of some event or the like. For example, this is the proposed explanation for why Hollywood decided to release two competing movies chronicling the life of Christopher Columbus in 1992. These movies, 1492, Conquest of Paradise, and Christopher Columbus, The Discovery, were both advertised as celebrating the 500th anniversary of the so-called Discovery of America. 
Twin films can also arise as a result of studios wanting to cover or delve into the same currently on vogue topic at the same time, but not necessarily having been inspired by the knowledge that another studio was working on something similar. Indeed, given the number of people working on movies, studios pretty much always know what other studios are developing at any given moment, whether they widely announce a project or not. Notable examples of this are The Truman Show and Ed TV, released in 1998 and 1999 respectively. Both of these were made made, as the British Film Institute puts it, as a direct result of an attempt to tap into the fascination with the then nascent reality television. Then you have studios simply noticing that a particular genre of film is popular at a given time and attempting to cash in on that trend. A great example of this is from the year 1979, during which five different Dracula movies were released, the most notable of which being Nosferatu the Vampire and Dracula, both of which weren't just simple retellings of Bram Stoker's original gothic masterpiece, but adaptations of previous adaptations of this work. So the next time someone complains about the supposedly new notion of Hollywood running out of ideas based on recent offerings seeming to be just a slurry of remakes, just remind them that at the end of the 1970s, studios released five Dracula movies in quick succession, two of which were remakes of existing Dracula movies. Remakes upon remakes has really been the order of the day, going all the way back to silent films, which were often just remakes of stage shows, books, or other silent films. A noteworthy early example of this is the 1939 Wizard of Oz starring Judy Garland. While you might be aware that this is based on a book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, published in 1900, you probably aren't aware that beyond previous Broadway musical adaptations, the 1939 Wizard of Oz was something of a remake of the 1925 film The Wizard of Oz. Yes, it took Hollywood just 14 years to decide that modifying the story a bit and adding a dash of new technology made The Wizard of Oz again a great idea. Listen, originality has never been the name of the game in Hollywood. Adapting existing works of various sorts has always been more of a rule than the exception. Modern cinema is simply no different. Now, as you'd expect for an industry where ego and self-aggrandizement are celebrated, even when studios learn that a rival is planning to release a movie with an almost identical premise, they seldom back down to divert resources into more unique offerings, which is a key reason so many of these films are released so close to one another. That said, there is a notable exception of this, and that would be the 1974 film The Towering Inferno. The movie originally began life as two different projects, optioned by Warner Brothers and 20th Century Fox respectively, following the success of a disaster movie, The Poseidon Adventure. After being outbid by Warner Brothers for the rights to a novel about the burning of a skyscraper called The Tower, Fox attempts to steal their thunder by purchasing the rights to a book with an almost identical premise called The Glass Inferno. Both studios were set to make their own version of the film, each starring big-named actors. Warner Brothers pegged Paul Newman for the lead, and Fox did the same with Steve McQueen. However, before production began, producer Irwin Allen convinced executives from both studios that there was no scenario in which either studio would win if they decided to compete with each other at the box office. Instead, he proposed that they combine resources to make a single superfilm about a giant flaming building. Not only would ceasing to compete on this one help revenue while reducing overall cost for each studio, but they could even have Newman and McQueen starring in it. The two studios agreed, and terms were quickly drawn up, with the historic union being formally announced in a press release in October of 1973 that read, It is as though General Motors and Chrysler combined their respective brainpower and manpower and went Dutch treat on the bill to produce a new model automobile. As for the film's title, an agreement was reached to combine the titles of the two novels that served as inspiration for the film. These titles were, of course, The Tower and The Glass Inferno, so the title became The Towering Inferno. In the end, the film was a massive hit, grossing ten times its production budget and was nominated for eight Academy Awards, of which it won three. Examples of films launched recently that were intended to be jumping off points for shared cinematic universes were King Arthur, Legend of the Sword 2017, and The Mummy 2017, both of which failed to meet box office expectations and resulted in plans for additional films being shelved. 
Meanwhile, a few years ago, Hollywood was all about adapting books aimed at young adults into potential epic series, examples of which include Divergent, The Maze Runner, Eragon, The Vampire's Assistant, Vampire Academy, A Series of Unfortunate Events, and the Percy Jackson films, all of which were an attempt to emulate the success of similar offerings like Harry Potter, The Twilight Saga, and The Hunger Games films. Now, looking to the future, it appears that twin films are very much going to remain a part of the cinematic landscape, with, for instance, there being at least a half dozen and Robin Hood films in development right now, including one that's supposed to be the launchpad for a new shared cinematic universe, of course. Just for fun, we can only hope that studio execs take a leaf out of Warner Brothers and Fox's 1974 playbook and decide to combine their resources to make a single great giant Robin Hood movie starring every major actor in Hollywood, a feat Marvel seems to be presently striving for anyway in their own little universe. And now for a bonus fact. Die Hard was actually technically an adaptation of a book called Nothing Lasts Forever, which in turn was a sequel to a book called The Detective. The Detective was made into a 1968 film of the same name starring Frank Sinatra. For this reason, Sinatra contractually had to be offered the role of John McClane in Die Hard, even though he was 73 years old when the film was made. Naturally, given his age, Sinatra turned down the role. However, Bruce Willis is now in his 60s and seems to be showing no signs of slowing down on the action front, so maybe we'll still see a Die Hard film with a 73-year-old star. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Now, if you are looking for something else to watch right now, why not check out the YouTube channel Cheddar. Specifically, let me recommend a video that they made about fast food logos. Now, you might have noticed, but you'll definitely notice when I tell you, and that's that fast food logos prominently feature the color red. And there is more than simple coincidence at play here, and our friends at the Cheddar Channel recently took a look at the science and psychology of fast food logo colors and discovered that while red is dominant, there may be a trend starting to move away from this color. You can check out their video to find out why, there's a link to it in the description below, and while you're over there, why not subscribe to their channel for more videos on a daily basis. So thank you to Cheddar for the support, and thank you for watching.